So next we are going to hear from uh, Jorgen Cox about more contemporary developments in the space of uh, identifying mass spectra and in particular uh, his aim to adapt those and make them useful for the single cell community. So I'm looking forward to hearing these developments, Jorgen. All right. Um, yes, I'm really very glad that uh, you invited me here. So um, I think it's actually rare that you go to conference and every talk is interesting and that's actually definitely the case here. Uh, so that's really nice. Uh, so yeah, indeed. So, um, so that what I want to talk about today is um, uh, so, so what we are doing or what we could do in the near future to also help the field of, um, uh, of single cell proteomics uh, on the software side to, uh, to, uh, to succeed. And um, so I want to give you a few uh, ideas that, that we have and also things that we already have implemented in uh, MaxQuant um, that, uh, that could be uh, useful right away, I, I would think. And um, okay, and so I don't need to um, introduce Max Quant to you. I saw already that uh, most of you are using it, but so maybe uh, one interesting fact about Max Quant. So since you are using it, you probably know that uh, you can only run it on Windows so far, and that really changed now. So we, may, we made an effort to have it running on Linux, and uh, that's also working very well. So it actually comes with, uh, uh, with, a, with qu quite some speed gain also. And needless to say, it's of course much more practical if you can use all the university servers, HPC, and cloud environments uh, that, that are usually or often uh, either requiring Linux or are much more efficient if you have it, um, uh, if you use it. Uh, so that can all be done now. So, um, there's also command line version which helps, helps you to integrate MaxQuant into your own workflows um, if you want to do that. Um, so, uh, so that's since, uh, since a few weeks that's out and it's, I think, readily adopted already. So uh, one thing you should also be aware of is that so it's actually two softwares that, uh, that we're working on. So there's MaxQuant and MaxQuant is the one that... Um, that is um, basically there for doing all the spectral analysis. So it does the analysis from the raw data up to the identification and quantification results. But then there's this other software, uh, Perseus. So this is the laser here? No. And that does the downstream analysis, right? So that is so and when, you, um, when you have your quantitative proteomics results, uh, so this is supposed to do the clustering, uh, PCA, and whatever, what have you analysis that you can do with, uh, with single cell data analysis as well. So, um, the lowest. Ah, oh, yeah, great, thank you. So, um, and so we, we plan to, uh, to put uh, algorithms that are useful for single cell analysis in, in both of these modules, right? So, in MaxQuant, there will be in particular um, uh, algorithms that help. Um, in, um, increasing, uh, increasing the dynamic range of the data and the coverage to, to identify low abundant peptides better, uh, which is the challenge in, uh, in uh, single cell proteomics. And in Perseus, you also want to offer tools to, uh, to do the, the analysis of the data for the proteomics data, but also for the transcriptomic data. So in particular, integrate tools from the transcriptomic world that are already available, but maybe offer them in, uh, in a way that is more accessible to biological researchers. So, so these are the, the, the aims that we have, and I uh, also hope to pick up some ideas or uh, requirements from you uh, to fulfill these, these aims. So, um, so what I'm, uh, am I going to talk about today? Uh, so, so first, uh, we start with, uh, uh, with the planet that uh, Bogdan was uh, on yesterday. And I have to say, it's not uninhabited, as you might have thought. So some, somebody was already there, actually. So, so uh, for quite some time, we are collaborating with, uh, uh, with Bruker on, uh, on Max Quant support of the uh, Timstoff Pro data. And we had just had a public release uh, at ASMS with the first working version for Timsoft Pro Data, and it's working. And actually, uh, just yesterday night, um, so while you were uh, celebrating or partying, I was actually making a new release that also allows you to, uh, to analyze um, a TMT data on. on <laughs> that, that is actually already uh, at the IT guys. I, I think they don't work on Sundays. That's the only reason why it's not online yet. It should be online tomorrow, I think. So uh, then, so there are also in developments in the uh, search engine um, that we 
that we are working on to Andromeda. So there, there will be a uh, version 2.0 uh, coming out soon, which is exactly there for identifying more low abundance, more not so good spectra and so on with more confidence. And uh, actually for that, we're actually exactly using AI to increase uh, the confidence in the identification of spectra. Uh, so then there are things actually uh, from what I saw you guys are doing in the downstream analysis of your single cell proteomics data. So you're having some kind of advanced way of uh, matching, uh, matching TMT identifications from uh, identified to non-identified spectra. So that, that's also something where we can do something in max quant, I think. Um, also, we can incorporate retention time and eye mobility. So eye mobility for the Timstoff uh, 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 machine, obviously. Prediction. And finally, we can, we can discuss uh, what we should actually put into Perseus. So starting with the tools that are already available from the RNA-seq world, and also maybe tools that are specific to, uh, to proteomics single cell proteomics. Okay, so let's start with the Timstoff planet. So, um, what, so the, the, uh, the aim was to adapt the established workflow for LCMSMS analysis, so typically applied on Orbitrap, but also already on, uh, on TOF machines without eye mobility to, uh, to, uh, to generalize this so that it works on eye mobility enhanced data. So that is data then that has one dimension more, right? You have LC separation up front. And then you have uh, in, the, in the mass spec, you have then on top of the mass separation, you have eye mobility separation. So you have one dimension more uh, in, in, your, in your data. And that has, of course, cons consequences to, uh, to some of these parts of the workflow. And uh, some of these parts are uh, uh, probably more or less untouched. And uh, so what is probably most different is the feature detection, because now you have to detect four-dimensional features instead of three-dimensional features that you had before. So that's, that's a big difference. And you have to do that in an, in a, in an efficient way so that uh, it doesn't take uh, um, too long for the computer to actually get, uh, get to a good answer. And then also how you project MSMS spectra out of this uh, higher-dimensional data will also be quite different. While all the other things in the computational workflow uh, so, so, so they probably all need an adaptation because th there might be different ways how you access the raw data for all of them. But conceptually, they are not going to be that different. Like, for example, if you want to uh, make a peptide to protein mapping, so this should not care about if, this, if the data is coming from eye mobility enhanced data or not. That should be more or less the same. Also applying protein FDRs and all of these things. Uh, so, so there, one would not really expect big difference to be necessary. So then let's go to the step that actually needs a lot of adaptation. So that's the feature detection. So, so far in MaxQuant, we were looking for these uh, 3D features. So then you have, uh, so this would be an isotope pattern as it looks in MaxQuant. This is the M over Z axis going in this direction, retention time going in this direction. And now we have some fourth dimension coming into the, into the game. And so things are changing now a little bit. So what, uh, what used to be, Oh, what, uh, what used to be uh, uh, the, the two-dimensional input space consisting of uh, mass and retention time is now replaced by the three-dimensional input space uh, consisting of mass, retention time, and eye mobility index or cross-section, however you want to uh, parameterize it. Uh, so the peaks uh, or features uh, used to be three-dimensional objects, mass, of, so mass, intensity, retention time uh, space, that's where they live in, and now they become four-dimensional objects. And uh, so in, in LCMS data, these features can be easily uh, visualized. So you can, for example, make a heat map. So you still have this mass retention time coordinates, and then you just color code the intensities uh, over, over this plane, or you can make some kind of 3D model thing where you can rotate the peaks and so on. So that's all doable. Now with this, um, with this dimension more, this is uh, much, uh, much more non-trivial to do. Um, so, but what, what you can always do is you can look into projections, right? So if you, for example, center uh, a projection onto, onto a peak of interest, then you can, you can have the choice between like three planes that go through this peak. So you can always fix one of the dimensions. And then in this kind of uh, plane or in this kind of projection, you can then do exactly the same. Uh, you can use the same visual tools as you was, were using for LCMS data. And so that's basically how, how Max Quant does it. So Max Quant actually has, a, has a, a visual tools for, uh, for this eye mobility enhanced data. And 
basically the way it works is you can always select a, a, sect, a slice of your data that you want to look into and then use basically to the tools as they were used for conventional LCMS data. Right, so how do we now analyze, analyze the data? So, uh, so in principle, you could say, okay, let's do some uh, you know, image record or volume um, uh, rec uh, um, object recognition uh, software, like you would, for example, do an fMRI data. So you also have a three-dimensional data cube, and you want to segment the data, right? You could do similar things here. Uh, however, that, um, that might not be the best way to do it, uh, because here you have actually regularities in your data that you should use so that you have a, a fast algorithm in the end, right? So if you would use a generic algorithm that can detect any, any shape in your data, that would probably also run a long time, right? And then you would, you would get into trouble in getting your data in a timely fashion. So that's why we use regularities of the data. And what we do is actually we slice the data and then we analyze the slices separately. And so what, in, in what direction do we slice it? So actually in the iron mobility dimension. So here we, we form slices and then each slice that we, that we get here is then actually uh, similar to what we had before. So it's actually, it looks like an LCMS run. And uh, so there's actually a, so a, a bit more uh, to do except for the slicing. So you have to regrid the data because it comes on an irregular, um, so it's on, on no grid actually when you get it from the Ruka raw files. We have to regrid it and also one has to apply a certain um, uh, certain ways of smoothing the data into the different directions to get something that is really hand handleable in, in, a, in a nice way. So, so we do all that, we slice the data. Um, then on these slices, uh, so obviously you can trivially parallelize the algorithm that's working on the slice, right? So that can just be uh, put into as many threads if, if you have, as you have slices, if you have enough uh, processors for that. And then um, the slice, as I said, looks then like an LCMS run. So we use the conventional max quant uh, algorithm to detect peak shapes on these. And so these, uh, these peak shapes, so here they were detected. And these peak shapes, they're actually, as you might know, irregular. So it's not just rectangles, but it's really trying to enclose the, 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 the intensity that belongs to this particular feature. So, so then once we have this, uh, we have now to assemble the features that we found in separate slices into these 3D or 4D, however you count it, features. So, so a feature, you cannot follow, the, you cannot track a feature over these slices and it would look something like this. So the Ein Mobility Index is running here and then you would see that the feature appears, first it is small, then it grows, grows, and then it fades away again, right? So then we just have to cluster or assemble these features from different slices into these four-dimensional or three-dimensional uh, shapes enclosing um, the, the, the feature. And then we, we get something like this basically out as a, as, the, as a shape enclosing this feature. And as you see, this can be, a reg it's not a rectangle or a cube or something like this. This really follows the shape of the data basically, right? And then one can decide if one wants to go on so if you now want to quantify, uh, so you have choices if you want to go on with the smooth data because we were all doing all the smoothing to be able to detect these shapes or you can also go back to the raw data and then just sum up the raw data that happens to be in this, uh, in this um, surface, closed surface that we determined for, for this shape. Right, so then uh, next step would be de-isotoping and so in, in conventional LCMS data uh, we would just um, use the intensity correlation uh, to, to find out which peaks belong together in isotope patterns. Like, of course, you have to have the suitable mass difference uh, to, to, be, uh, an is to belong together uh, in an isotope pattern of a certain chart, but then you always use the intensity profile correlation. And this becomes now more powerful because now you have actually correlation into two directions. And so this is actually more specific and should actually work better to, uh, to determine what belongs together to an isotope pattern and determine what is actually the monoisotopic peak of the, um, of the, I mean, that was already working quite well, I would say in Max Quant, but uh, if anything, it can only get better by having this additional dimension uh, to, to judge uh, what belongs together. So now we have the MS1 features. Um, so we want to have the MSMS features as well. So they're also living now in one higher dimension. 
Uh, so I don't go into the details how they're actually acquired. So it's actually a, quite a complicated scheme on running on the machine uh, with, this, uh, with this parser feature, uh, how, how these are actually scheduled and, uh, and acquired. So I don't go, go into the details of these. Uh, but so, so they are now there, and they also have this additional dimension. But so basically from the MS1 features, you know where, where you have to look for the MSMS that belongs to this, uh, to this MS1 feature, right? So because you know exactly the shape of this in retention time, Eye mobility and mass, and then you just look into the MS MSMS data, and you can just project out the MSMS spectrum out of the MS of, out of the uh, MSMS data, and that's what we do. So we project out um, the spectrum, and then you have some conventional spectrum as if it was taken from the usual LC MSMS uh, workflow, right? And um, also things like, for example, TMT quantification. So that's also simple. I mean, it should, of course, improve because you have this upfront uh, separation by iron mobility, and also it, it does to some extent, I think we see. Uh, but also the quantification is very simple because we anyway project everything down to these uh, conventional looking spectra, and we can just read out TMT reporters as we do it in normal LCMS data. Right, so then, uh, yeah, speaking of quantification, so, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, TMT is easily done, basically, but also label-free quantification, so as it's, uh, as it's used to be done in Max one so that also translates one-to-one one to one into, uh, into this uh, iron mobility data, and so you might know that we have this Max LFQ algorithm, uh, which, uh, which I think solves very well all these challenges that are coming with... Uh, with label-free uh, quantification so that you have to find features across runs. So for this, we align the retention times and we have these very precise masses that makes the matching of features between runs uh, also um, uh, qu qu quite um, qu uh, can, can be done with high quality because of this. And uh, so actually now you have actually an, again an extra dimension to distinguish which features in two runs actually belong to each other, right? So, because, so this matching of a feature, the transfer of the identification of a feature that has not been sequenced in one run uh, be becomes more specific now because you have the eye mobility dimension that distinguishes the features better, right? So, um, so that's also one advantage of, uh, of, of, this, uh, of this machine. So then, uh, yeah, so match between runs. Um, then we, we, uh, we acquired, so this is just the first benchmark data that we looked at, it's just a single shot uh, so these typical experiments where one mixes uh, different species. Uh, so it's three species in this case, and so they're mixed that between the replicate groups, the humans, human data should be one-to-one, -one. Uh, or the, uh, or the um, uh, yeast data should be one uh, uh, factor of two down, and the, uh, there's also E. coli data, and so there should be a factor of three up. Uh, so the typical benchmark, so I don't go much into the details, but you see, so the quantification data is, is there uh, where it should be. So, so this is not the final benchmark, this is just the first benchmark we did to see that it's working, and, and it is working, basically, right? Uh, so we, we don't really have um, final data on how much accuracy is actually uh, cha cha getting better or worse, I don't know, uh, between the technologies, so... Right, so, so um, that, was, um, that was about the, the, the Timstrof Pro. So you can see it is supported. Uh, so, so we have been testing it quite a while because internally uh, with Brooker, we have, uh, we have, uh, we've been working on this probably for more than two years, I think, with them. And during the last year, we were already running prototypes of the software with them. Uh, and it, it's relatively crash-free at the moment, I would say it's uh, highly parallelizable, which is uh, in particular important for this first part, you know, where you do all this uh, feature detection in many slices. Uh, and also you would think that would actually uh, delay the whole process by a factor of 100 or how many slices you have there, but that's not the case. So it's actually much faster than you would like trivially think it, it should be. It's fast, it's of course slower than uh, typical, than normal LCMS runs, but it's only a factor of two or three. That, that it is slower, right? So it's absolutely realistic. You might need a, a bigger computer, or your computer is now really in use uh, if you do if you do this kind of uh, uh, data analysis. But it's it's really within the range of realistic. So 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 the bioinformatics will not be the bottleneck in this game. So. Okay, so that was the the first thing. So that's basically uh, ready to use. 
Uh, another thing that uh, another um, thing that we're working on that uh, that should benefit the single cell proteomics is this Andromeda 2.0 version. So Andromeda is a search engine that is integrated uh, in, into MaxQuant, and so it it, ca it comes with MaxQuant. And basically, if you use MaxQuant, you have to use Andromeda basically. So that, that that's how it is. And it, it's a bit similar to to MassCort in. Um, in, in its, in its, in its uh, general principles, so it's a probability-based search engine. So the score is something like a minus log of the probability of getting that many matches that you see between experimental and theoretical spectra by chance, that many or more, actually. Uh, so it's a bit p-value like, uh, uh, like score. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so the question is now, how could one actually improve the scoring? So, uh, and in, in particular to uh, to, be, to be able to identify um, the things that are in the twilight zone at the moment with, uh, with, with higher confidence. And so we, we, we put two new features into, uh, into Andromeda 2.0. So, uh, so one is actually the uh, T-sequence tag supported scoring, and the other one is uh, fragment intensity prediction. So the sequence tag supported scoring, so what is that? So that is just a way of... Um, of, uh, of uh, discriminating two solutions or two matches, two PSMs to one spectrum that might, might have now the same number of matches, but where in one of the matches you have consecutive matches and the others you don't, right? Because in the, in the PSM where you have consecutive matches in an ion series, that's actually more likely to be the correct one, right? So if the matches you see are Y5, Y6, Y7, that's more likely to be correct as if they were Y2, Y7, Y14, right? So, and so, so that we want to put into the score so we want to give them a higher weight, and uh, so we do this by uh, by splitting up this this k number. So k is actually the number of matches. So the score relies on two uh, numbers. So the, the n is just the number of theoretical spectra that you put in, and then k is the number of matches. And there's not, nothing else than this uh, binomial score um, probability of getting this uh, this many number of matches uh, uh, by chance. And so we modify now the k uh, into, into, into a sum of three k values, k, k o, k zero, k one, k two. And so, so what is the distinction between them? So they just, uh, they, so they just count if, um, if you have a match with no neighbors, if you have a match with one neighbor in the series, or if you have a match with two neighbors in the series. And of course, the best is a match that you have with two neighbors, so that should be scored better than if you have a match with only one neighbor or with only zero neighbors, right? So that, that's how we do it. And then these, so there are then weights in front of these K, K1, K2, uh, K0. And these weights are just empirically determined. So what are the, so we take a big data set and then determine what are the best values for K to get the best performance out, basically. And of course, you have to do this separately for, for different fragmentation techniques, obviously, right? So that, that's, of course, done like this. So um, that's the first thing we do. And then here, you just see, based this on some HLA data, actually, again, um, you see uh, how much it improves the coverage. So we would actually then op operate it in a way that the old and the new version, we, uh, we would run at the fixed FDR, so fixed PSM FDR, and then we see how much the coverage increases, and you see it actually increases well. So not so much with ETD, but that's also expected, right, because there the fragmentation is a bit more a spread, uh, expected to be spread in general, but also even there it actually improves uh, the, the um, coverage. So that, that was basically the easier part of the, uh, of the improvement of Andromeda score. So maybe now we come to the bit more complicated part, which is uh, the fragment intensity prediction. So the idea is here that uh, so if you are able to say from the sequence of a peptide, if you're able to predict uh, what the spectrum should look like, uh, that should really help you in the process of identifying the spectrum or the peptide from the spectrum, right? So it's from my point of view, very valuable information. So I don't see why that should not help actually the process of identifying uh, the, uh, the peptide, and, and it does. So, and, uh, so how do we do uh, this prediction? So the um, best thing you, you do if uh, you want to, uh, want to fulfill a task like this is to get, uh, get help from some experts uh, who, who know all about, and these are probably the best experts you can get. So we, uh, we are in a collaboration with, uh, with very live sciences on this. Uh, yeah, so led by Peter Simmermensik on, on their side. And then, uh, so it's actually three graduate students on my side are, are working 
on this project. And uh, so what then what we came up with then uh, as the model one should use is this uh, bidirectional uh, recurrent uh, neural network for doing this prediction. And um, so it, it has a few n nice features. Uh, so one of them is actually that it can work on input of variable length. So, so because the model is actually coming from, for example, natural language processing, and then it would uh, take word by word as input. And obviously, words have varying lengths. And so uh, that you can also then uh, do with peptides. So you don't actually have to train models on peptides with fixed lengths. And then for each model, then uh, for each length group, then again, a different um, a, a, diff a different model, so which is actually done in the state of the art, right? But so do we, we don't have to do that. We can just feed all the sequences at once in there, and then yeah. So it doesn't really probably matter too much what's happening exactly in these um, in these modules here. So this is this so-called long short uh, short-term memory um, module, so that just makes sure that it can learn uh, relationships that are that are close in the peptide sequence, but also relationships that are. Uh, long distance in the, in the in the peptide sequence, right? So it's some technical things. So we also use that for natural language processing, quite established, but also quite complicated. What's exactly going on there? But then, so what is also uh, interest very interesting is that you can so before you go into this uh, these fully connected neural network layers here, you can feed in metadata, and so this metadata can be anything you know about your experiment. So in particular, we feed in the fragmentation type in there. So we actually have only one model that learn simultaneously to predict uh, HCD and CID spectra, right? And we just feed this in as a metadata parameter so that the machine knows what, what, what it's supposed to learn, basically, there, right? But also other things like, uh, like fragmentation energy and all these kind of things can be fed in there as meta parameters. so that the idea is that in the end, you have basically one big, gigantic model that knows everything, right? It's, it's actually going to be two because it's actually difficult to, uh, to parameterize ETD-like spectra and ACD-like spectra in one model. But that's the only reason why we have two. Everything, all the other information um, that could be variable between experiments is actually fed in as this metadata here. And then, so the output is then the Y and B, or for Y and B intensities for CID, HCD, but also the neutral losses are coming out of this. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that's it, right? So. Um, then here you see that it's uh, actually working on one example, right? So there is then one uh, spectrum uh, as it is measured and uh, as it is predicted, and you see, you see this is uh, pretty similar. It's of course easy to pull out one spectrum where it works, right? So you want to know if it uh, if it works in general, and it, so it does also work in general. So what we see uh, performance-wise is this here. Uh, this here. So um, so this is actually distributions of Pearson correlations. So Pearson correlation between the, the common peaks in the uh, theoretical and the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, predicted spectrum. So, so that would be one correlation coefficient for, for, for this pair. And then now we have many. So I skipped over how exactly the training set and test set look like. Uh, so I should mention this is, these are huge training sets, and you also need huge training sets for deep learning, right? So that's actually the... Uh, the, the beauty, but also the curse of it. So, you, so just with 100 examples, this machine will not learn anything, right? So this really needs uh, lots of data, but it also can handle lots of data. That's the good thing, right? Um, so we just downloaded 25 data set from, uh, from Pride, so quite big ones. Actually, one, one of them is actually a crystal synthetic library, so that's just one of the 25, and that's where we are training on, and then we put aside 5% for validation and 5% for testing. So that, so on these 5%, five, this 5% 5 of this big data is still a lot of data, so that's where these distributions uh, are taken from. And so what you see is, so this is basically in the middle, so we call this deep mass, this, uh, this model here. So in the middle, you see um, the, 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 the performance, so the distribution of our Pearson correlation coefficients. Uh, what you see on the, on the left is uh, so the uh, current state of the art, which is MS2PIP from the Leonard Martins uh, lab. And so, so what you see on the right is the theoretical upper limit. So why, why do we have a theoretical upper limit? Because uh, so if you, um, if you measure the same spectrum twice, you still will have a variability. And then, but you, then you can never get better than this variability, and that is for us then the theoretical limit, and you see that we are much better than state of the art, and that we are actually reaching, almost reaching the theoretical limit of what is possible, so. 
yeah, here you just see that split into uh, your different pins of uh, you know charges, precursor charges, um, uh, length, uh, mass analyzers, and so on. And in each of these bins, you actually have the same order, so that we are better than the state of the art and almost reaching the theoretical limit. Right, so, so now we are good at predicting these spectra, so how are we going to use them now? And so we're actually using them for, uh, for, for uh, DDA and for DIA. So I'm going to report mostly on the, on the DDA part today, but it also looks very good what you can do with this on, on, on DIA. And so the way we use it on DDA is uh, um, by defining this so-called uh, symmetric binomial score. So, and so what, what is that supposed to be? Um, so I was saying in the beginning that we're just counting matches of fragment peaks between the theoretical and experimental spectra. So, that's actually, so that looks like we're actually not using int intensity information at all, but that's not quite true. We're actually using the intensity information because we're doing the scoring for many sets of top scoring peaks in the experimental spectrum per 100 Dalton interval, right? So that is just counted better if you find these matches among the high abundant peaks in the spectrum, right? That should be a better explanation than as if you have to go into the grass and uh, get, get your matches from there, right? So we were already using the intensities, but only from the experimental spectrum, right? And now we just do the same because now we have also intensities on the other side. So now we do exactly the same from the other side. So it should actually count better if you get these matches from theoret 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 theoretical peaks that you expect to be high abundant from the prediction, right? So we do exactly the same from both sides. That's why we call it symmetric binomial scoring, basically, right? And so, yeah, so uh, what does it look like? So let's, uh, again, start with some anecdotal examples. And this is actually from, the, from Bernhard's uh, synthetic uh, library. So the good thing here is that you know what the correct answer is. And then so we find many examples where we actually get the wrong PSM without the intensity information, but we get the correct PSM with the, uh, with the intensity information included. And so you have cases like this one here, uh, where you basically just, uh, you had the wrong, or so, so overall sequence is almost correct, but you have the wrong order in one place, right? And so we can put them into the right order by using the intensity information in this case, but then you also have examples uh, where you have completely different PSM, right? Where you had the wrong PSM to start with and with the, with the added information, you get you get the right the right one as a score. So that that's good. So uh, synthetic data is actually good to work out these anecdotal examples and see how how they get solved. But uh, it's not so good actually for um, for making performance estimates because it's it's actually too low complex. You have not not enough examples really to uh, to uh, to to think about what the um, what the FDR what what are the con conclusions on FDR and coverage and these kind of things. So that's why we then. Uh, go, go to HeLa data sets so where, where we don't know the ground truth, but still we can measure how the, uh, how, how the coverage changes with fixed FDR. And so first of all, you see here the score. So this is Andromeda, the, the old Andromeda score, Andromeda 1 against the new Andromeda score. And uh, so, so you, this, you see two things. So at large score values, uh, actually there's no change. It's exactly the same. And that's also good because if we would get a, new, a different score for these things that were supposed to be uh, very, very well identified with the old Andromeda, if we now get a different answer, that would mean, okay, some, either we were very bad before or something is wrong now, right? So we're happy that this is not happening. But then you see if you go, go down, so into the zone where the identification are not that great, maybe, uh, you see you get a different answer and the new score is always bigger, but that's by construction. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it's better, but by construction because the new score is taking the maximum over many different scorings and one of them is actually the old score. So by definition, it can only get bigger, basically, right? So, and, so, and it does, so, um, and then, but the question is, uh, does it, I mean, does it really improve? And for that, we then uh, look at the uh, percentage of uh, identified uh, MSMS spectra as a function of the Q value. So, this, so on, the, on the horizontal axis, you basically have the FDR, so a Q value, if you choose for one of them, then that's the FDR that you would have in your data. And then uh, red and black is then obviously the old and the new scoring, and so you see that it's always better. So in, in a whole range of Q values, always better, at, on, at least on the CELA data set. Uh, so it, it Particular uh, big are the difference actually for in the high, uh, in the high um, specificity regime actually, but so it's always winning. 
Um, and so I should say, so this is actually the first shot at it. So there are still a lot of parameters that we haven't even tuned. Like for example, which intervals of top scoring peaks are actually looking at and all these kind of things. So I think it can still get much better than it is now. So this is really uh, just proof of principle that it's working. Right, so that should be certainly helping the uh, single cell analysis, I, I think. Uh, so timeline, so at the moment, as I said, we are on, on the level of proof of principle. It's really working. There are still a couple of, uh, you know, software issues to be worked out. So this has to be really fast and so on. And we have to talk to this TensorFlow system, uh, this, this Google system that makes its predictions and so on. But uh, so as you saw, we have uh, three PhD, three of my best PhD students working on it. So I'm sure we will find a solution to all these uh, technical details. Yeah, I, I cannot wait to search our data using the, the Neuromax quant, but my question is that considering how accurate your predictions of intensities are, I would expect that you can have even larger gains if you don't simply use their ordinal order, but you use uh, the exact numerical values, simply because you're doing so well. If your predictions were less accurate, then your approach would make a lot of sense just to use the order of intensities. But in this case, I think you can extract even more information from them. Absolutely. Like so probably by going to some kind of cross-correlation or something like this, one, one could get even better. So this is just a, a very simple way to do the correct thing, basically, right? So that, that's why we started with this. Uh, but so, so there are many. I mean, this is one, one other direction where it's probably optimizable. Yes, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Great. I love it. OK, so then that, that was um, this thing. Then, then when we get into um, another topic that, uh, that actually uh, Nikolai already addressed in his way, how he, how he is actually post-processing the Max Quant results. Uh, for single cell data, and so one of the one of the things you're doing is actually to dig out the uh, MSMS spectra that were not identified, but however, by matching between runs, you know that this is the thing you want to quantify, right? So basically, if you uh, so if you have like two LCMS runs, so this was run one and run two, uh, then you always have situations where you have. Uh, for example, identified th this MS1 feature here, and so the identification also comes with all the TMT quantification in your case, basically, right? And then you have, you have this other feature which has the same mass and same retention, so after retention time alignment, also the same retention time. Uh, and uh, so for this particular application, it might also have an MSMS spectrum, which, however, has not led to an identification, right? So then in, in most workflows, I actually also in MaxQuant at the moment, that would actually not be considered for the, for the TMT quantification, right? And, but, I mean, the information is all there. Uh, so, so you probably had a hard time of putting all of this together post-processing, but uh, so I, th I think it would be quite easy for us to just, you know, put that information out into the tables in, uh, in MaxQuant. So, so that's something uh, we, uh, we definitely want, want to do to, to, um, to help the field. And... Um, so that, since it's really doable, I think this should be a feature that is there in, in a few weeks or something like this. Right, and then, so finally, uh, so you saw we also have this Perseus software for the downstream analysis. Uh, and um, yeah. uh, speaking of, uh, of this Ferrari Model T kind of uh, uh, comparison, so we are definitely not the Ferrari, I think. Although it's fast, right? But I think we always go for uh, ease of usability, both in the Max Quant, uh, but also in this Perseus software. So actually, the one and only reason why we came up with yet another framework for downstream uh, bioinformatics is because it's still difficult to use many of these frameworks for, bi for biologists, for medical researchers, for pharmacologists. And we basically want to put the tools into the, into the hand of, of these kind of researchers. So basically, that all the information is processed in the same brain, like the biological, but also the statistical, basically. So that, that's why we came, came up with this. And of course, um, we want to also uh, put tools uh, from the world of single cell, both uh, transcriptomics and also proteomics and, into, into this. So that, I mean, that's just starting. So I have a postdoc who just started, whose task is it to do that, exactly that. And uh, so certainly, you will be able to do TISNI maps and uh, maybe also other ways of doing this, like, for example, with kernel principal components and things like this to do this. And uh, so then, um, actually, uh, so one thing we want to do is to make it, as I said, really usable so that, for example, you don't get always a completely different map as soon as you change something, some little thing in your workflow and things like this. So that's also something where I really want to collect uh, 
ideas or even some kind of to-do list from, uh, from people here and uh, get some inspiration on what, what, uh, what, what the users really expect from this kind of package, right? And we will just do it, basically. So, um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's the, what we do and what we're planning to do. Um, maybe uh, just to remind you about this uh, Timstof uh, feature. So the, it is supported since version uh, 1621. Uh, so that was released just one day before ASMS, basically. Um, so the, the TMT support is, uh, is there since 1622, and that will come out tomorrow if our IT guy is not sick or something like this. But uh, So that should be uploaded tomorrow. Uh, so then the match between runs, uh, what I was just showing, so that you can uh, use the TMT quantification via match between runs, uh, that's not yet in the version tomorrow, but then the version after that, um, it, it will come out, so it's really easy to do. Uh, so I was talking about the Linux support, uh, so that I didn't mention one thing, so that's actually, that was actually Thermo Fisher, what I was talking about, right? Uh, for Bruca, it's, it's not working yet, but that should also be easy because Bruca always generates two libraries, one Windows and one Linux library for all of the things that they're doing. We just have to connect it to MaxQuan. So that should also be uh, coming out in the next release. So then, um, yeah, retention time and eye mobility. I actually wasn't talking about that. So that's another PhD student who's working now on retention time and eye mobility prediction. And so it's actually a quite simple task, I would think, because he just needs to dump down the model that does the spectral prediction, right? Instead of having n out or two n outputs for y and b, it just needs one output, which is the retention time, or then the other model is the other output is then the eye mobility. So that should be more or less doable for PhD students. So that will also come out um, uh, later this year, and also Andromeda 2.0. So we are still working on soft, like software. Uh, engineering issues, and that will take us for probably for the rest of the year to, to get this uh, up and running. Uh, and Perseus ongoing, so there will be frequent releases, uh, and so that will be just whenever we have something, it will be in the release, basically. So, yeah, that's what I had to say, so I thank you very much for your attention. Wonderful work, and you're doing a great um, benefit to the community, a great service. So uh, I have a few questions. One is um, uh, loosing eyes are loosing. When will we finally close this uh, pitiful chapter in, uh, in mass spectrometry? Yeah. Um, so you're referring to the technical problems in Max Quant with that, or to the oh, solution I mean, I to this problem? All, all examples of peptides that you have shown yeah. have either loosen or isoleucin. Yeah. The, the first peptide had three loosens and one isoleucin. Mm -hmm. So uh, usually we just ignore and call them ally. But uh, they are different, of course, in terms of fragmentation, especially in, uh, in ACD or ATD, mm -hmm. there is a, there's a difference specific fragments, so are, they, are these resolved? Yes, at the moment we don't have anything to resolve that, but as you say, as you say of course there is information on that in the fragmentation. Mm -hmm. We might give it another shot because, uh, so theoretically they should also have slightly different uh, cross-section, the, the peptide that has uh, leucine and isoleucine. Uh, slightly different abundances, slightly different intensity of fragments, mm -hmm. slightly different cross sections. But, so, but now that we have yet another dimension to uh, to sort that out, uh, that might be worth giving it a try. Yeah. So, absolutely. Okay. So, um, uh, then assembly of uh, peptides into proteins. I wonder whether you have noticed this de facto algorithm that we introduce as a factor analysis how the peptides behave from run to run. It only makes sense when you have multiple runs. And so the peptides that co-correlating, correlating, uh, they're much likely to belong to the same protein. And if there's a peptide which by MSMS seems to belong to that protein, but it behaves, its intensity behaves very different compared to other peptides of the same protein, it should be rejected. I don't know whether uh, this is implemented. It's not. It's a great idea, but it's not implemented. But uh, so that's probably asking for for a more general question. Uh, I think I think one solution to that would be if we would just provide the plug-in possibility for for these kind of things, right? So that there are certain algorithmic steps, 
where we say, okay, this is like some pro programmatic interface that you just have to adhere to, and then you can come in with your own, for example, peptide protein assembly algorithm, right? So, I mean, that's something that we definitely want to do in the future, but that's also a bigger uh, software engineering project, so that's not something we can do tomorrow. Uh, but I think that would be actually the general solution to the specific problem, and then you can just provide, I mean, you, you cannot only pr uh, then program it for yourself, but you could then basically provide for the community a plugin that does a different kind of... App uh, Store for Max Planck. App Store for Max Planck, exactly. So, um, the final question. Um, we still don't have organism search engines. I don't know whether you remember, there was some eight years ago, it was a debate uh, when there was a science publication that people claimed to have identified peptides from collagen of dinosaur bones, some 65 million years old, or 80, 180 million, I forgot mm -hmm. which one was that. No, no. So, and it turns out we cannot even answer this question because we identify peptides, we identify proteins, but we don't identify organisms. Shouldn't we start our analysis by identifying what organisms are present in this sample? Like in your example, there were three organisms. How would we know? How would anyone know, given this LCMS run? You know, we don't have statistical model. We don't have, uh, we don't have uh, approaches validated. Isn't it time to finally uh, address this problem? And it's not a theoretical problem. We have mycoplasma contamination, which can be easily detected in cells mm -hmm. by, by this kind of search. We have viral contamination, and so on. So that would call for some kind of uh, pre-search of your data that tries to find out basically the general properties, um, which, which I think is great. I, I think some, I, I think Bionic is doing something like this already, right, which looks pretty good. Um, not, not, not regarding species, I think, but I, I, I fully agree that would be very good to have. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I would just continue with uh, basically what Roman started. Thank you very much for all this project that you give to the community. You know, we love all Max Quant. Uh, two things, you know, since I'm kind of uh, say 95 plus percent uh, Team T labeled person, right? At this at that moment, but I still have those five percent that I'm running label free to check what I have before I'm labeling. What our uh, observation that label-free data that we run quickly to check our quality of the something that we about to TMT actually drastically differ from the TMT spectra. That's why I would say that AI engine that predicts the fragmentation of the particular peptide, if you can see the same peptide before labeled and after labeled, the change of the all intensities are quite different. That's why I, definitely you have to look into the uh, you know database of the TMT labeled peptide for the TMT prediction. Yeah because there is a um, quite a different uh, fragmentation pattern, especially there is a problem in the first uh, 100 Dalton, because that's where the TMT channels are. They go through the roof compared to the normal, you know, kind of spectra, and they diminished the ammonia mines and all these things that you want, want to use for, you know, addition of the information to your spectra. That's number one. That's why the just suggestions just run piles and piles of all we can give you. I have piles and piles of the TMT data to look through because the intensity is drastically different. That's why you need to kind of account for that. Uh, number two uh, question, you know, at the current situation right now, when you do identification, and doesn't really matter in TMT or not TMT mode, you just have the uh, peptides and then in the peptides you look in the a column where it says unique or not unique. Currently, if it's not unique, it's been thrown away right away from the identification uh, procedure for the quantitation. No. Well, okay. currently that's what I do, basically. Okay. Those that are not uh, unique, then I put my uh, specification, for, for example, in protein discovery, just unique, razor peptide just been removed in, in my workflow, right? Okay. Uh, for, the, for the good reason that I do not understand how the PT make these decisions and I don't want to rely on something that I don't understand. That's why on the max quant, since you're open, I, at least I can understand what you do about those. And currently in the team T uh, of the single cell field, we have an advantage of what just Roman just said. We have the same type of samples, with all the same meaning, the same single cells run 
many, many, many times in the rows. Many single cell will have a plates with the TMT labels that has the same carrier channel and in single plate. That's why you will have this advantage to see if it's a razor peptide and that, you know, razor peptide across many, many runs actually shows intensity of the highly abundant protein. That's why we just need to dump this ability that it's possibly those low abundant protein because we can see clear evidence that it's it's high and, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. That's why I think this that part could be really improved by our runs because we have a lot of repeats of basically the same type. Yeah, yeah, yeah to the first side, I didn't really talk much about the scope of this uh, this prediction, uh, so what is trained on. So at the moment, uh, so indeed, so one, of course, if you want to make prediction for TMT spec, you have to train on TMT spec, right? And then probably give this as a metadata flag, this was TMT, this was not TMT, right? So we're not doing that at the moment. We're also not doing modifications at the moment. So what, what I was showing you was actually uh, unmodified, mostly triptych, so it's mostly learning on triptych peptides, but there's nothing in the algorithm that uh, favors tript. I mean, you just have to show it non-triptych peptides, and it knows how they work as well, right? Um, so that is all just, you know, things that, uh, you know, have to be implemented, and so this just, uh, you know, work, but there's not, no conceptual problems coming there. And so, so the way we want to do it, so we want to basically uh, make updates of this prediction model. So let, let's say every three months there would be a new version which is in, incorporate new data and would have more capabilities, right? And then at some point it would also know how to predict TMT spectra. Then about the, um, the non-unique peptides, so, so, you, so what you're doing is it's, it's, it's very stringent. You're probably aware of that, right? And so, so for, for my taste, probably maybe even in the range of overstringent because if, so if you're dealing with uh, uh, data with an uh, organism with a lot of splicing, like human data, for example, then a lot of these uh, non-unique peptides are not unique because they belong to splice variants that could be distinguished based on some other peptides somewhere in these proteins, but which are anyway then in common between these splice variants, which end up in two different protein groups, right? And then, and this is actually very many, so this can be like half of the peptides that you have that are just uh, gone because, because of this criterion, basically. So that's why we typically don't do that, but then we use them as razor peptides in, in one of the protein groups, right? And that's, of course, heuristic rule, so that is not the law of nature, of course, mm -hmm. uh, which works reasonably well, for, for most cases, right? So, I mean, that, that's just what we are doing. So you're doing something different? Yeah, yeah, on the, the large proteins, that that's, a lot of peptides that's what I do too for the single cell. is a little bit too dangerous because your coverage is shallow, right? Yeah. So if you have at least one which run, so to speak, you kill the whole, you know, the whole full proteome because usually you have a one or two peptides in our case scenario. That's why we, at least me, just to, to decide to be on the stringent side. But clearly, we're losing a lot but of data. That's also exactly where what Roman was saying, taking the, uh, like the behavior of how many samples into account would definitely help in that case, yes, actually. So there have been a, a number of attempts to predict fragment ion intensities. I mean, going way back to the 90s. Um, there was a guy who used to write a program at uh, Amgen, Zhang, something or other, uh, that used MRK calculations to predict fragment ion intensities, and that actually was pretty accurate. Um, the, the problem with all these methods is that they worked really well for doubly charged peptides, but when you got up to plus threes, plus fours, and more, then the, they all kind of fell apart. So I'm curious how your, your deep learning um, is working on these higher charge states. So I think we even had a slide on that, so I went over it a bit quickly. Uh, so I think it's still doing reasonably well. So here, so here it's actually split by. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, actually, the upper upper left one is split by charges. So that's starting with charge one. Uh, so two, three. So you see, three is the third one. So that that's still okay, right? So it's not completely falling apart, basically. So. Yeah, Natalie on went as far as to take that program and create um, for every triptych peptide, every W charge triptych peptide in the database, a library spectrum based on Zhang's calculations, and then they created a uh, database searching process, but it was really just a library searching process. That, I think it worked pretty well. I think it was published in 2005, probably MCP. I think it worked pretty well, but um, never went any further. Mm -hmm. But you also see that, the, so the state of the art is really not performing well on charge three, right? Char so charge two, it's not that far away from, from us, so the red one is the the MS2 pip, but so on charts three, it's really not doing well. So, so exactly what, what you were saying, actually. So. 
Hi. Uh, about the deep mass training, um, when you are training the uh, recursive uh, neural network, uh, what's your training data? And um, uh, and can you comment on that? Uh, in general, in proteomics, there's seems like there's no ground truth data because for some sequ for some spectra, we have like ninety nine percent of confidence that is comes from some peptides, but for others, we have like 80%, for others, we have like 50%. So how do you, uh, so, so first is where is your training data, and second, how do you train data on these uncertain data? Yeah, very good question. So, so because there's some, some debate also if one should do now all the synthetic peptides, because then you know the ground truth, basically, right? Alternative is you just analyze your data with uh, whatever stringency you like. So we actually reanalyzed all data. So we, we got it from French, whatever's there, but we don't take the original analysis, but we reanalyzed everything with Max Quant, with 1% uh, uh, FDR on PSM and on protein level. And then we take this, this as an input, which means there's actually less than 1% uh, wrong predictions in, in, in the, because you apply the protein group uh, FDR also, so you actually have le much less than 1% PSM FDR in your data, and that's good enough for machine learning. So machine learning can learn on noisy data. So that it's not the case that everything has to be 100% correctly labeled. In so 1% mislabeled, that's actually very good data for machine learning, right? So, so uh, um, from my opinion, it's actually not, so for, for just having a, a good model, it's not necessary to do synthetic web. Of course, it's nice, but uh, we could also live without, I think. I have a very short suggestion for your to-do list for Perseus. It will be useful to be able to easily import annotations of lots of lots of single cells, particularly annotations in the form of 96 or 384 well plates. Because if people generate large amounts of data, they, they may want to be able to import the annotations, for example, to label different single cells that have been processed in some way based on this. Um, other properties. Okay, annotation from the sam sample prep or what? what That's right. For example, let's consider a, a specific case. If we are sorting cells by fax sorter, we might measure up to three, four, five parameters for each single cell on the fax sorter, and that information can be encoded as a matrix meta file characterizing that mm. cell in addition to the proteome of the cell, and it will be very convenient if there is a handy way to import these data because generally data import-export issues tend to be unpleasant and time-consuming. They're easy, but they can be a hassle. Mm. So if, if you have a way to import annotation from standardized files, particularly files that can easily accommodate 96 or 384 well-played format, uh, that can be quite convenient. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, you know, one, so of course one can have annotation in uh, Perseus, yeah. and yeah. I think uh, there's also the possibility to, to read it from some Excel sheet or something like this. I think I would like to specify that that idea basically, uh, it's probably not for the max quant actually, but it's for the Perseus. Yeah, 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 yeah. When, you, when you search these things, then you, you, you would have an option in Perseus when you load your outputs, right? Mm. Then it would be an extra possibility in Perseus that you would, when you load your data, right, already into the Perseus, then it will be the ability to import a standard fax sorting files. Okay. I see. Because okay. the 99, probably maybe 100% of the things that we will do in a single cell, there is a fact sorting because you need to know what you're dealing with. I think you just have to provide me with an example, and that sounds something absolutely yeah. 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 Actually, I'd like to uh, second that as well because we have implemented converters from Max Quant into MS stats, and we found that even for like bulk experiments, this is the single step that our users struggle the most because they can get all the peak intensities and IDs just fine. Yeah. But then now they say, okay, now we need to annotate which run came from which biological replicate and which condition. Mm -hmm. And we found that this is the biggest sticking point right now. So it would be really great to do some kind of user-friendly way to essentially annotate the runs at the very beginning so that they can be exported downstream. Pro probably particular for TMT data because then you have the added complexity that you have like 10 channels or eight or however you use Exactly, it. and so most mistakes that we have now from the user side is because the runs are annotated incorrectly. Okay. Yeah. Right, right, the, the conversations over phone sometimes, you know, sounds really crazy if somebody would listen to me. Okay, 127N or 131, yeah, and so on. That's really decoding things needs to be done. Okay, no taken. Uh, This is more for Roman. <clears throat> you know, you can search 
all the databases you want to. If you want to search the entire world of sequences, you can do that. It might take a little while. Uh, the other thing is uh, we showed 1995, you can differentiate leucine and isoleucine on four-sector mass spectrometers with a database search. Uh, Burlingame's instrument. So it's doable. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right.